up on 5th November 2023 when operatives again raided his hideout at Filin Dabo, Dede area of Abuja, where he was arrested with 56.9 kilograms of cannabis sativa and 42.7 grams of diazepam. In another raid in the same area of the FCT on Monday 13th November, a suspect Yusufa Ibrahim 27 was arrested with 75.3 kilograms of cannabis. Meanwhile, a massive operation in the forest of F1 Alaye in F1 local government area of Ekiti State on Saturday 18th November 2023 has led to the destruction of 52,500 kilograms of cannabis sativa covering over 21 hectares of farmland while a total of 92 bags of same substance weighing 1,380 kilograms were recovered and another 250 bags weighing 3,000 kilograms stored in different huts on the farm were also burnt. No fewer than 15 suspects were arrested on the farm during the operation. They include Okikiri Julius, 27, Oziomeni Friday Efajemu, 31, Tosin Ibrahim, 18, Israel Samuel, 25, Godwin David, 39, Friday Isaac, 19, Ayomide Ibekele, 18, Joshua Daniel, 27, Emmanuel Iwachuku, 19, Emeka Onyema, 31, Annie Augustine, 27, Obasi Ogu, 32, Osusue Peter, 23, Daniel Emmanuel, 18, and Yunusa James, 22. In Ondo State, five persons, including another wanted drug kingpin, Christopher Onyebuchi, 40, were arrested at New Bridge Compound, Idoani, on Wednesday, 15 November, and a total of 1,945 kilograms of cannabis recovered from them. Others include Olorunda Ojo, 52, Femi Tomoye, 22, Abdurrahman Salahu, 29, and Momo Jimo, 31. Onye Buchi had earlier been arrested by NDLEA on 25 March 2022 with 89 kilograms of the same substance, but jumped bail after he was arraigned at the Federal High Court Akure. Operators in the state also on Sunday 12 November raided Upemen village in Owo, where they recovered 1,834 kilograms of same substance, with 273 kilograms also seized the previous day, Saturday 11 November, at Upesi, Akoko. While NDLA officers in Sokoto recovered 290 kilograms of cannabis from a female suspect, Fatima Salamanu, 20, at Gangaren Tashar Ilela, Sokoto, in Sokoto North Local Government Area on Thursday, 16 November, their colleagues in Edo State evacuated 808 kilograms of the same psychoactive substance stored in a forest at Igwebun on Monday, 13 November. Not less than 231 kilograms of cannabis were recovered and five suspects arrested in a joint raid between NDLA operatives and soldiers in Kwande Castle of Benue State on Monday, 13 November. Those arrested include Denen Temba, 25, Liambe Yorna, 36, Yorna Shugan, 20, Abo Sonte, 23, and Sendu Tioka, 36. While operatives in Ogun State on Tuesday, 14 November arrested a suspect, Tony Jonah at Abule Iroko with cannabis sativa weighing 67 kilograms. Those in Lagos arrested Chike Agu at Ago Palace Way, Isolo, with 364.3 kilograms of loud, a variant of cannabis. In Imo State, NDLA operatives on patrol along Oweri Onicha Expressway on Monday, 13 November intercepted a truck marked XS 669KRD driven by one Orji Ifanyi 33. A search of the truck led to the seizure of 82,320 pills of opioids, including tramadol 225 milligrams and diazepam, as well as 32.5 liters of codeine syrup and 100 pieces of molly weighing 49.62 kilograms. While commending the officers and men of the FCT, Ekiti, Ondo, Sokoto, Lagos, Edo, Benue, Ogun, and Imo commands for the arrests and seizures of the past week, the Chairman Chief Executive Officer of the NDLEA, Brigadier General Mohamed Bubamorwa retired, urged them and their compatriots across all formations of the agency to intensify the offensive action tempo against drug cartels as the ulitide season approaches while maintaining a balance with their drug demand reduction efforts. That's it on our and seizures. Now here are the water activities across the country for the week. The advent of the War Against Drug Abuse WADA Advocacy Initiative has made the most significant difference in increasing the awareness of the dangers of drug abuse and prevention efforts of the NDLEA across the country. On Monday, the 13th of November, 2023, no less than three commands were at different locations to inform school children and authorities on the importance of a drug-safe society for a prosperous nation. 
This included the Benway State Command, which lectured over 900 students of Tilly Gado College, North Bank, Makodi. The Jigawa State Command at Junior Arabic Secondary School, Megateri, and the Ocean State Command at St. Thomas Grammar School, Otan Ayed Bajun. On Tuesday, 14 November, the Ogun State Command delivered a water sensitization lecture at Victory Christian Academy, Abekuta, while the Akwai Bomb State Command conducted a similar activity at the Main Lab Technical College, Oron. The Anambra State Command on Wednesday, 15 November, facilitated a sensitization lecture for students of Anglican Girls Secondary School, Ogidi, and the Palti State Command delivered the same to the students of Government Science College, Western. Continuing the water activities for the week on Thursday, 16 November, was the Kano State Command at Husna Science Academy, Zaria Road, and Government Secondary School, Gano Fage, local government area, as well as the Ondo State Command at Zeni Standard College, Ikare, Akoko. Rounding off the water campaign for the week was the Semi Special Area Command on Friday, 17 November, which delivered a message on the role of religious institutions in enhancing the drug war mm -hmm. to an audience of Muslim faithful at Mad Badagri Central Mosque, Badagri, Lagos State. That's the update for this week. My name is Blessing, and I hand you over to our host, Mr. Femi, Baba Femi. Thank you very much, dear Blessing, and welcome back from the News Highlight segment. Now, let's quickly remind ourselves about um, some of the rules, um, as we do every week, guiding our process of engagement on this program. Please note that when we approve you to be on the speaker's corner, please ensure that you remain muted until after our guest presentation, and we invite individuals to unmute themselves to ask questions and make contributions in a few seconds. Please also note, it's very important that we make, we know that um, we all have quite a lot to say, but then because um, of the short space we have for this conversation, just two hours, so we may not be able to take all that you have to say. Please try as much as possible to summarize all you have to say in a few seconds so that um, we would be able to pass the mic around and then we'll have um, uh, contributions from um, as many as possible. We also want to let you know that we do encourage unauthorized interruption. We don't discuss policies here strictly on the issue of uh, substance abuse and illicit drug trafficking. That's all we're focusing. We're focusing on mental health. We're focusing on public health here. Please let's um, um, face a thematic focus on this platform. Um, okay, that's that. Okay, we would like to thank you for usual cooperation. Today's program, um, we'll try to make it um, interesting, especially with um, the caliber of the woman um, we have in our guest, our special guest today. We know that um, she is going to... Um, She's going to make uh, this conversation as interesting and um, as informative as possible because um, I've read them um, quite a lot and I've had them. Um, and of in fact, I'm very um, for Dr. Abdullahi to have spoken that highly of her. I know definitely without even going to uh, read her profile, definitely she must be a woman of great knowledge and great substance. So let's. Um, or get prepared to uh, benefit from her wealth of experience and deep knowledge on the space today. Uh, we'll try as much as possible to also respond to all your questions and take your contributions. Please note on today's subject of discussion. So let's take them um, and enjoy the conversation. This is all part of our commitment to engage with all our stakeholders in all that we do. Now, before I introduce our guest, please let's, um, let me quickly dash to um, the NDLA's call center, um, where we have um, our professionals ranging from counselors, psychologists, psychotherapists, uh, psychiatry doctors, and um, all the mental health experts that you could uh, imagine where we have them working 24 seven to attend to the needs of those struggling with substance abuse. And um, there uh, we have a dedicated um, toll-free helpline, which is 0800-1020-3040. I repeat again, there we have dedicated toll-free helpline, 
that anybody can reach from any part of the country, be you in the Northwest, Northeast, North Central, South South, Southeast, Southwest, you can sit in the comfort of your home, whether you are the one in need, directly in need of help, or you have a friend who is in need of help, or you have a family member that is in need of help, please do feel free to call this, this line, 0800-1020-3040. Our mental health expert would attend to you, will listen to you, guide you, and support you through teletherapy. And if... Um, after the assessment of your situation, if they need to lead you or guide you to the nearest um, rehab facility close to you, they will do that. That's part of our contribution to ensure that we'll bring help, especially to those who are afraid of stigmatization. You can rest assured that your identity does not really matter. It's your situation that really matters to them. They will listen to you, and so you have no fear of being judged or being stigmatized. That's um, um, part of what um, the leadership of the NDLA is doing to ensure that uh, those that really need help get help without, um, so nobody really has an excuse not to get help again, that is those st struggling with substance abuse and who really need um, help. Okay, that's um, uh, as far as that is concerned. Okay, I think I would also like to add that indeed um, for those um, who may think, okay, now with um, this kind of um, facility, would all the people there, these uh, professionals, I mean, counselors, um, psychologists, psychotherapists, doctors, would they not be speaking BB grammar that would, um, that would not be able to understand? Beyond that, these are people that can also attend to you in Pidgin English. And if you can't speak English or Pidgin English, we also have um, services provided in three of Nigeria's major languages that is Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo. So they can attend to you in these major um, local national languages in days of the week. Please feel free and take advantage of this. Now let's uh, move quickly to uh, take a presentation from um, um, Hiya today. Now, Dr. Um, Hiya today will be speaking with us today on family based prevention and support in substance abuse and mental health treatment. This is very key um, getting help or getting treatment for people uh, in substance abuse or in mental health um, crisis or situation. Um, how important is the family? How do, what do the family um, need to do to prevent? or even when it happens, how do they um, facilitate help or treatment for these people? Um, these are much more A consultant psychiatrist in 2019 as a fellow of the West African College of Physicians. She has also participated in hundreds of public enlightenment programs in both Hausa and English languages. Very good trying to get the message or help the needed help to the people who need them, even in the language they understand, just as I explained on what the NDLA is doing, also to provide help for those who need help in the language um, they understand. Okay, now moving forward on um, why is he trying to unveil Dr. Hayatu Dim. With a special interest in youth and women's mental health, Dr. Hayatu Dim has participated in several research projects around mental health with her dissertation work that focused on assessing a biological index that may differentiate um, schizophrenia among patients with substance use disorders and other forms of schizophrenia. Over the course of her career, she has had to provide care for individuals with substance use disorders, dealing with 
multifaceted interdisciplinary needs of individuals with substance use disorders. She is currently the head forensic psychiatry unit, Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Kaduna, co-head medical psychotherapy unit, and head medical services unit in the same institution. Please join me to welcome and invite Dr. Nafisa Hayatuddin to please unmute herself and let's uh, listen to her presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Nafisa, for um, um, obliging us, for joining us, and for um, giving us all that you have prepared today. Thank you. You can go ahead now. Okay, thank you very much, sir. It's, um, it's a real pleasure and very humbling to be invited to give a talk in such a, in such a forum. So thank you very much. Um, if I may align with the already established protocol. So I have been asked to talk about the family, the role of the family in preventing and support for individuals with in preventing and supporting individuals with substance use problems or disorders and mental health problems. So um, I will try as much as possible to be clear and simplify um, what I have to say. Um, so substance abuse, mental health, these are tightly interwoven you know, um, concepts where you can't actually separate one from the other. Substance use disorders are actually part and parcel of mental illnesses. They are diagnosed as mental disorders because largely there is a problem with emotions, with behavior, that is actions, and with the thinking in individuals that either end up using the substances or as a result of the substance, the substance use, there is a change in their emotions, in their thinking patterns, and in the way they behave. So these are tightly interwoven concepts. Now, in management of any substance use disorder or any form of mental illness, there is no way management can be just the health, formal healthcare providers. That means the, the hospital, the doctors, nurses, the mental healthcare professionals, and the, and the client environment. Nigeria, where we have a very strong family social system and we actually rely heavily on the social capital that is provided by the family. So you can't have care for anybody with substance use disorder or mental illness without collaborating and working closely with the family. Now, the role of the family in, in mental illnesses and substance use disorders is on several levels. It works before the illness even comes up or before the substance use starts. Sometimes even before the child is even born, the individual is born, there are issues that center in the family. After the individual is, bo is born, that individual is raised within that family setting. So, and the way we are raised has an influence in how we view the world, how you know, we develop our attitudes, our personality. I think Dr. Nafisa is having um, a network issues there. Okay, am I breaking? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. You, okay. you went off. You were actually oh sorry. At the point okay, where you mentioned about several layers of um, oh, okay mental from yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, I'm right. sorry about that. Okay, yes. so um, the the you know the levels by which the family is involved is multi layered. You from the Point, even before the individual is born, the family dynamics are important because how a couple would even have that child, sometimes issues come up even from then. After the conception of that individual and the person is born, the person is raised within the family structure. And the way we are raised has an influence on how we see the world, our attitudes, our belief systems, our values. It has a major role to play. And then by the time a person is, let's say, an adult or an adolescent and now develops a substance use disorder or um, a mental illness, it also becomes very vital. The role of the family becomes vital because every individual we assess is assessed in the context of his family. 
So the role of the family can never be overemphasized. Now, the impact of substance use. We know that when an individual, one person in the family starts using substance, it, it changes a lot of dynamics within the family and it affects the individual members of the family personally and it affects the dynamics of the family. So the consequences of substance use range from emotional reactions in the individuals, physical reactions also, because sometimes people now suddenly become more violent, more aggressive. Um, there are social consequences such as loss of finances, you know, and things like that. Limited resources are being expended in the course of substance use. Now, I would like to look at the family from some, you know, um, angles. The first one is the family as a risk factor for developing substance use problems. Now, if there are problems, you know, with the family dynamics, it can lead to several, several problems. For instance, when we talk about causality for any mental illness, you know, what causes it, what are the things behind, you know, why is this problem manifesting or why are we seeing it? We look at it from three major angles. The first one is biological. This talks about our genetics, you know, the things we inherit. We know that some substance use disorders are actually, there are, there are some risks that are inherited, like alcohol use. Even if a child does not grow up in the family of a, together with the father, for instance, that had, you know, um, dependence on alcohol, there are still higher chances than other people that are not born by that person or that kind of individual. There's, there's still a high chance for the child to later become dependent on alcohol. The same thing for some other substances and similar risks are found in other mental illnesses. Now, after biological factors, we look at psychological factors. Now, I talked about the personality, isn't it? Our attitudes, our beliefs, our thoughts about life, how we perceive things, how we, you know, the enduring, the way we behave almost all the time, the way we see things, the way we perceive things. Now, this is largely shaped by our upbringing. And we also know that, especially for substance use disorders, we know that certain things that can happen within the um, you know within the family can predispose an individual to developing substance use disorders such as events now any adverse childhood experience for instance it could be parental separation which can have the, which can be perceived as traumatic for the child that is involved depending on the circumstances on so many many things now, being exposed to things like that or being exposed to um, very catastrophic events like flood, loss of everything, being abandoned um, or neglected or being kidnapped, you know, remaining in custody, these are all potentially traumatic life events and they can increase the chances of the individual later in life developing um, substance use disorders. The same thing with some dynamics within the family that can also, um, how would I say, predispose to or should perpetuate. That means it will make the problem to continue. Again, I think uh, Dr. Haya today is also um, I don't know. Okay. What else. I, guess, no, I, I guess you are. I? Yeah, some calls are coming on your system, right? Okay. So, uh, no, 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 sir. I think it's okay. okay. I, I know what to do now. It's okay. okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm truly sorry. I'm truly sorry. Uh, not a so problem. I was sorry. talking about the emotional responses of family members, you know, to substance use, to the discovery of substance use. We know that when, you know, it becomes noticeable to the family members, let's say the parents, the father, or the mother suddenly discovers the 16 year old you know is experimenting with cannabis with weed now the reactions that the family you know do that mani that they manifest at that time can have you know some psychological effects on the person using and can predispose or increase the chances that that person will continue using so for instance if there's shock and there's denial 
you know, refusing to accept. Maybe the mother was the one that actually saw him smoking, passed by the window, saw him smoking. And she goes into denial about the whole thing or refuses to, to tell anybody, keeping it secret, hiding it. Now, this can indirectly enable the person to continue using, and that can increase the chances of the person becoming dependent. Now, the next set of factors, you know, and um, ways by which family can be a risk factor is social. We know that um, financial difficulties or poverty are, are major, how would I say, um, factors. You know, we, we find mental illnesses, substance use disorders more commonly among people of lower socioeconomic standards. Now, this can be explained in so many ways, many, many ways. It could be the substance use that led to the poverty. It could be the poverty that led to the substance use. But we know that poverty is closely related. And this is a social factor. This is something that is not the individual, is not the person that is responsible for. Um, if there are problems within the family dynamics, you know, either unresolved issues, maybe some betrayal in the past, there's conflict between the mother and the father, it can lead to um, substance use among the children. Miscommunication. If, for instance, you know, some parents actually send wrong signals to their children. They mean one thing, but they do the opposite. Or they say one thing, but they will do the exact opposite. Remember, children, you work with what we do, not what we say. So you are telling them, you are, for instance, as a parent, you are telling a child, be honest, be this, be disciplined, be hardworking, be this. But these same children are seeing you being the opposite. So this can lead to several issues. Or when there, are, when there is a communication break, where or a gap between the substance user or the children and the parents in the family. Now, these issues can all, you know, predispose to, to um, substance use problems. Other issues include financial instability, if there are financial problems within the family, if there are emotional problems. For instance, parents with mental illnesses or some other form of, you know, um, emotional difficulties that they are going through. They may be so preoccupied with what they are going through that they don't perceive or um, they don't um, pay much attention to what is going on with their words and their siblings. Now, for this, at this point, I would like to briefly discuss some roles, you know, some kinds of roles that we see among family members of, patient, of individuals with substance use disorders. Now, the... The first one is the addict, you know, that's the person using the substance. That one is usually very clear, you know. Once the person is discovered, it's known to be the user. But along the line, we have some other rules that other family members can, when you, you know, you can find them fitting into one or the other or even a combination. There's something we call the enabler. Now, this enabler is an individual. Most times, it's a parent or a sibling, usually an older one, that kind of protects the, the addicts from facing the true consequences of their use. For instance, the person steals, uses substance, causes havoc, creates problems, but this family member is the one person that the addict or the user would immediately call. Why? Because they know that person is ready to clean, come and clean up the mess. That is an, usually an enabler. Because by not allowing, preventing, or protecting the user, it, it denies the user the opportunity to possibly reflect and see, appreciate the consequences of their substance use. The second role we also have is the family hero. You know, we see that dynamic at times. You find it usually is the firstborn, the eldest child of the family, you know, if, if he's not the one using or the immediate, the immediate sibling after the first child, maybe the second child. You would find that this person would be, you know, would just take responsibility, kind of like they, they step up, they become very responsible, very diligent, whatever mess the, the substance user causes, that one will try to clean it up, will try to just to maintain peace. Sometimes on interacting, you would hear them say things like, no, 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 my parents cannot still be bearing this thing. So I have to take it up. I am the eldest, so I have to do it. 
now this is a family he hero he, this kind of person usually bears the brunt of any problem that is going on within the family they feel that it is their role to actually fix everything they are responsible for what is going on then sometimes you also see the scapegoat in the family you know the scapegoat in my own personal experience as a psychiatrist i see it a lot where the mother is being scapegoated for the substance use when the when the person is using the substance you know and is a problem the father can quickly just blame the mother is your fault you are you were the one that indulged him too much you didn't allow me to discipline him well when he was growing up so you know so this kind of person by being blamed repeatedly remember there's a lot of distressing emotions a lot of conflicts the parents are the person is already blaming himself one way or the other for contributing to the substance use of this individual and they're now being blamed openly now this can lead to internalization where the person will just believe truly truly is my fault and by the time such guilt is internalized it can incapacitate that person from being effective in helping the substance user to recover they will just accept it as their fault and that's it then there's another role we also see occasionally which is the mascot usually this is the youngest child in the family you would find out this one maybe let's say it's the second born of the family that is using substance or the third child that is using substance this one is usually the last born trying to just maintain peace one way or the other you know just um ah no wahala you know when the parents are having conflicts or fighting the brothers the elder ones are fighting among them the substance user and maybe somebody else that is trying to checkmate their behavior this one is one that tries to maintain peace around the house to to reduce the tension usually they are at a loss for how to handle how to handle this substance use how do i how do I still balance, maintain peace in this really conflicting situation within the household? Everything is still, you know, um, it's just tension filled. Then sometimes we see the lost child. Now the lost child usually manifests when there is um, parental substance use. You know, with substance use, there's so much preoccupation with the, per the person is preoccupied with what is going on, what with his addiction. So usually the children, some children become neglected and they are just overlooked. Nobody pays attention to them. Nobody knows what they are doing. They don't actually experience proper parenting. Now they learn to avoid, you know, everything. They just avoid situations. They would just you know, um, find a way, leave the house when they when they have to. If there's any arguments or there's any feedbacks, um, let's say interaction where well, you're supposed to give feedback as family members. Now this lost child may actually just leave, and it can lead to self-esteem problems and give birth to other mental illnesses such as depression, anxiety, and things like that. Now another relationship, you know, um, how would I say negative relationship dynamic that we find is something we call codependency where the individual, this usually it's somebody in the family and most of the time it's an enabler. The, the person becomes so dependent on the substance user emotionally, like as if they cannot, it is their own palaver. The substance use is their own. So whatever they can do to defend, to protect, to prevent negative consequences, to prevent anything, in fact, sometimes you would hear things like, I beg, don't worry, it's them that have wala. They are the ones that, that are always complaining. They are the ones with the problem. You, just, you know, just be yourself. Don't worry, I'm here for you, you know. They are the ones sometimes when a person is trying to break free, an addict is trying to break free, go for treatment. For instance, going for rehabilitation. They are the ones that would come up with every possible excuse in the world. And no, oh, he has to go to work, he has to do this, and the wife did this, giving all sorts of kind of excuses just because there is a of being abandoned by this addict. Now, this relationship, this kind of relationship or attachment is extremely unhealthy and can be really counterproductive to any improvements or recovery being aimed at. Now, so um, after a description of these negative rules or adverse rules of the family, the family can actually be protective and preventive of 
you know, substance abuse and mental illnesses. Now, the dynamics of the family, for instance, you know, can serve as um, a way to protect against substance use. In situations where the style of parenting that is used. Now, parenting styles are very variable and they are very fluid. However, for us, there's something we call authoritative parenting, kind of like the, the bite and blow kind of system, you know, where there are strict, you know, there's structure, there are rules, there are consequences. Children that are usually brought up in this kind of setting and are nurtured well, they know they are loved, they know their parents are strict, but they are strict for the right reasons. Now, individuals that are raised um, don't tend to use substance as much as those that grew up in other parenting styles, like dictatorial styles, you know, or authoritarian parenting styles, you know, like just regimental. It's only me, it's only the, the parent that gives the instruction. You can't give comment, you can't give feedback or where the parents are very permissive. Anything you want, oh, no problem, just go, take it, take it, you know? No, nothing like it's not available. Nothing like, no, this is too much. There are no limits, no rules. Um, or in parenting styles where the parents are overly involved, like he helicopter parenting, you know, where they don't, every single thing, the parents are involved in it. They don't allow the person to make any decisions about their lives. Everything, it is what the parents want that, that they want that has to be done. Now, it creates kind of a dependency where the individual does not learn how to, to take life, you know, by the bulls, uh, by the bull, the bull of life by the horns. And the person becomes, you know, inadequate, feels inadequate, feels in, incapable of actually standing their own two grounds. So they may resort to substance use to encourage or boost their morale and their confidence. Um, other factors within the family that could be protective of mental illnesses are, if there are you know, um, secure attachments being developed. The codependency I was talking about, we see it more in you know, the helicopter parenting style, where the parents feel the children are part of them. And so everything, they have to be involved in every single thing. Now, raising children or parenting is something where you have to strike a balance between being there, helping, guiding, protecting, and giving them independence to learn on their own. Now, other factors that help within the family are if there is open communication or an environment within the family that allows for open communication up to down, down to up. Not that it's just unilateral, only up to down. Parents giving instructions to children. But when children are allowed to also give their own opinions, they're listened to, they're given a chance to bring their ideas and suggestions. This helps in developing confidence in these individuals, in the children. And, you know, it allows if, there are, if they have challenges that may lead them or gravitate them towards substance use, they are more likely to share them early and so can be guided and help to navigate through them. Dialogue, open dialogue within the family, very, very important, very important. Issues that come up, we hear families that have um, you know, family time where they give topics and things like that. All these are healthy um, ways to encourage communication between um, family members. Realistic and objective views of family members. Now, what this means is that you have a brother, you have a sister, you have a, a parent, you have a child, and you see this your child, you trust this your child, but you see this your child hanging around or hanging out or being absent, you know, for some, or you get reports of this person truanting school, not missing, skipping school, just going out in town, or spending a lot of money. You, despite the fact that you love this, your in, your loved one, your relative, you should not. One should one should not be blind. You need to be objective and be realistic, be vigilant. You see the kind of company your your loved one keeps. You should be wary. You know, you should tell yourself the truth that, no, 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 I need, to, I need to pay more attention to what is going on. Breaking the stigma is also very important because substance use disorders, mental illnesses, they are highly stigmatized 
conditions which can discourage people, the addicts, the family, discourage everyone from coming out and even seeking for help or seeking any information or em emotional support just to help them cope with this challenge of the substance use. Now, the family can also play a role of teaching healthy coping skills. You know, there are healthy ways of coping with life difficulties. For instance, someone going through a challenge, maybe being bullied in school or something, that can lead um, a young person or an adolescent to start substance use, to experiment, and then may eventually become dependent, you know, and continue using. Now, if the family environment is such that the individual is thought, oh, when you have challenges, you know, you can bring them to the table. The person understands that they can come seek information or seek support, seek advice from others. Now, that is a healthy coping, coping skill that if it is nurtured within the family system or within the family sphere, then it can prevent um, and protect against substance use. Other things that families can do to help to protect or prevent substance use or it deteriorating is to educate, educate family members, educate loved ones. You hear anything about the consequences, the problems of substance use, how people can get into substance use, what could lead to it, what could make it persist, share it. So the family can serve as an avenue for educating. It can also serve as an avenue for monitoring, for monitoring. Because, like I gave the scenario earlier, you are vigilant. You pay attention to the kind of company your loved one keeps, you know, the kind of absences they have or things you can't really explain. If the person is now being shady, is now being evasive, you can, you can, you know, be more vigilant when it comes to that. Try to investigate, find what the issue is, see what you can do to monitor some activities. Setting boundaries is also very important because when a person knows, okay, this and this and this, I can tolerate this, but you can't bring this and expect me to just take it. Now, this has been shown to also help in preventing or limiting the deterioration of substance use um, disorders. Now, other, other things that could be implemented in the family, being good role models, as older, as older siblings or parents in the family, um, you can be good role models to others, to those coming after you not using substances and things like that. Um, encourage, encouraging, you know, um, individuals in engaging activities like sports, extracurricular activities, sports, religious activities, you know, anything that the individual is interested in nurturing that any healthy thing that the individual is interested in nurturing that supporting them giving them the money for it you know taking them enrolling them in such maybe classes or sessions have, are all known to actually help to prevent or pro protect against deterioration of substance use disorder now what are some of the outcomes of you know these interventions by remember i mentioned about education you know, if the family is educated about substance use, they understand it, then they are more likely to identify when substance use starts. You know, this involves recognition of early warning signs of substance use and even mental illnesses, actually. They have some signs that are quite, you know, common to both of them. Now, some of these signs are behavioral changes. Behavioral changes. Someone that you know is generally very timid, very calm, Those kinds of um, things can be behavioral, you know, manifestations of substance use disorders or mental illnesses. Other emotional changes in the person. Someone very happy, go lucky kind of person is suddenly now easily mo very moody. Today is happy, next tomorrow angry. The, another day is, you know, mood swings. Problems with money. Those ones are usually the, the, they are the, how would I say that, some of the quickest to identify problems with money, especially if the money isn't so freely available. You know, persistent asking, 
Uh, no school. They've asked us to bring, um, you know, two thousand naira for this. Next tomorrow is another thing. Another day is another thing. Unlike before. Now these are some of the early warning signs that someone is beginning to use substance and on prying further or monitoring or investigating, it can become evident. When it becomes evident, one should not use those unhealthy emotional responses like denial or being angry or whatever. No, face the issue head on. Now, this early recognition is very important because it allows for timely intervention. Whatever problem or whatever illness is coming up, if there's an early intervention, you know, if something is done about it early, it's usually easier to handle and the disabilities that come along with either the addiction or the mental illness are limited so that the person can quickly, you know, kind of move on from that chapter of their lives, recover, move forward, and then forge ahead and live a productive life. Now, another important thing or another benefit of implementing such in the family is that it allows for early seeking of professional help. You know, if within the family other things are tried, you know, to check, meet, to monitor, to do this, and they're not working, then the family is more likely to agree, oh, no, this is getting out of hand. Let us seek, you know, professional help for you or guide or help the person, encourage the person to seek professional help. Now, it's also important, you know, in the sense that accessing community resources like this kind of forum, this forum is an exceptionally good one because it allows people to learn more about substance use, how to go about it, what to do, how to, how to recover from it if you're already afflicted. Now, this is a community resource that nearly anybody can access. So it's also a good thing. Um, there's also a need to dispel myths and misconceptions. The issues of stigma, you know, when there's encouragement and support from the family front, it, it improves outcome. It allows people to, to be empowered, to be encouraged, and it is saying to the world that we, I am with this, my loved one. I am with him, doing the, trying our best to recover from this challenge of substance use or mental illness. Now, this after, besides the family playing a role as a risk factor, you know, for mental illnesses, the family can also be important in the stages of treatment. Now, we know that families that seek easy and quick fixes to problems, let's say substance use, just take the person to, um, ha to pilgrimage, you know, a religious pilgrimage, a religious surgeon, or go to some prayer house to do something. You know, these are quick fixes, you know, trying to just see, oh, let's just, you know, do this, it will just fix the problem. People, families that do that, and those that easily lose motivation, that means, you know, they, they are trying to help and then a little hiccup happens along the way and then they just give up. We know that families that function in this way or that handle substance use in this way are more likely to tip the person to continue using. They, they usually hinder treatment and hinder outcomes. Now, the, the, the role of the family is actually multidisciplinary, as I mentioned earlier. However, when family dynamics cause a problem in the treatment of substance use disorders, there's a particular therapy we call family therapy. Most rehabilitation programs, nearly everyone, there's an involvement, there's a, some form of family therapy being you know, in, employed because everyone understands the role of the family. Even traditional rehabilitations, um, spiritual rehabilitations, rehabilitation programs, they tend to incorporate some level of family. In the person family. However, in some situations, there are some people that within Yeah, the network, um, <clears throat> Dr. Nafisa is having issue with her network again. Dr. 
Dr. Hayato De, can you hear me? I guess our network uh, flipped there. Okay. Um, oh, we lost that. Okay. I'm, I'm sure she would um, <clears throat> she will come back shortly, but then uh, before she gets back, um, let me quickly acknowledge um, some of our patrons already on the space but sorry i i couldn't um i couldn't get to do that okay she's back but then um before before she before she continues i have sent her okay let me quickly acknowledge um Okay, we have International Society of Substance um, Use Professionals, that's ISOP. Thank you for joining uh, the conversation today, like I said. Okay, then we have uh, Toby. Toby is a regular. Thank you, uh, Toby. We have Dr. Abdullah, like I, I introduced him before. Dr. Abdullah is, um, apart from being um, a consultant psychiatrist at the Amadou Bello University, he's also the director of SL Mental Health Foundation. That um, platform he uses to provide help and support to those um, in need, especially those I mean, struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, if um, Dr. Hayatu Dean is not... Uh, okay, she's still around. I'm sure it's her network. I learned... Um, there are some heavy downpour um, some parts of the country. Maybe that's affecting her there. Then I'm sure Dr. Abdullah will step in at the right time, at the appropriate time. Okay, let me also acknowledge um, our own patriotic, Ken Patriot. <clears throat> thank you, Ken Patriot. Um, thank you, um, Gidado, Ikeshuku, Funsho Jimo, Blank Mind, Dr. Keita, Farida Hazan, Prince Jacob, uh, Salmat, Alicia, our own uh, Para Bawa, Sunday John. Thank you, our own commander there in Kwara, Bashir Ibrahim. Thank you, Mohammed Bafo. Thank you, uh, Gambo Ayuba. Thank you, our own uh, Tinui Dowu. Tinui Dowu is joining us from Maryland, US. Thank you for sharing your time with us, for sharing time with us on. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Fatima Abu Ali. Thank you, Hamza Abdullahi. Thank you, Peaceful Peace. Our own very regular, John Ogunjimi. Um, we also have Abdul Samad Hamisu Ahmad. Um, I, I'll take note of some other persons and um, I'll be recognizing you. But then, um, pending when uh, Dr. Hayatu destabilizes, I guess. Uh, maybe she's also, I also believe he's, um, I, I've also seen um, our own Dokita Ladega, Dr. Dr. Ladega, thank you for joining the conversation today. Okay, let me, Dr. Abdullah, if you're available there, let's um, let have um, quickly your own perspective to <clears throat> the issues already raised or in addition to what uh, Dr. Hayatu Dean had stated, let's have your uh, perspective to the topic of today. That is family-based prevention and support in substance abuse and mental health treatment. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for always being there. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Femi. Baba Femi, once again, thank you to all the listeners. I must say Dr. Nafisa Hayatu Dean has done, uh, as usual, uh, justice to the... Uh, subject matter. Uh, and I hope uh, as family members, we'll be able to implement some of these things and uh, avoid the pitfalls that she has uh, highlighted. The pitfalls that many families often fall into while uh, trying to address the issues of uh, substance use, especially the enablers. It's usually a problem, a big problem when you have a family member who is uh, using substances and uh, uh, a misdirected love, kind of. Yes, they care about the person, they love the person, but
but the way they are intervening is actually making the whole problem worse. So I pray and I believe we'll be able to look at those uh, pitfalls. Once again, thank you very much, my maximum chief, Dr. Nafisa Hayati Dean. Thank you very much. Uh, please permit me to also recognize the presence of one of my uh, very senior colleagues, Dr. Gidado Mohammed, who is also a psychiatrist at the Barodico Teaching Hospital. I'm sure he will also have one or two things to share with us. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. I know I cited Dr. Gidado. That right? I know I've seen, I've come across. Uh, okay, I just saw Gidado. I think I just noted. I think I recognize him, but he's not on the speaker's corner. Okay, I'm sure he would. Um, if um, he has a contribution, he would um, would be very much obliged to approve to pass to give him the mic when he's ready. But before we have, um, I know I. I think um, Dr. Ayatudim may might have stepped aside. She actually had that conversation with us to step aside for some minutes, some five minutes to take her prayers. But before um, she returns, I think um, Dr. Abdullah, let's um, let's quickly um, you have to fill in this space for her pending when she returns. Um, she's on the space, but I guess she's praying at the moment. Okay, because we already have. Okay, let me quickly put this to you, Dr. Abdullah. Um, okay, uh, let me even go to someone. Um, somebody shared a question. Let me check that out. Okay, um, this is from Joel Trade Hub um, in our DM. Um, he's asking, please, I want to ask, is smoking weed a bad thing? I understand weed is illegal in Nigeria. However, misusing it should be what we should mostly talk about. And secondly, does smoking weed make one make wrong decisions in life? Dr. Abdullah, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, please uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, yes, uh, as, a, as a psychiatrist and uh, uh, with the benefit of uh, the experience we have had and uh, with the researches available, yes, smoking weed is a bad thing. And when we talk of misuse, uh, any psychoactive substance an individual try to use, Usually, they start on a scale that we will consider not harmful. But because of the interference with the reward system, that is the part of the brain we call the reward, uh, reward pleasure system, with time, the amount of dopamine, that small amount of weed was causing that uh, VTA, the ventral segmental area of the brain to release so that the person feel good. You know, with time, uh, the individual will need more than what he, he has started with. That if you are taking just a wrap of weed per day, with time you will need to take two, you will need to take three, considerably increasing the amount of weed you need to feel the same effect you were feeling. So when you talk of abuse, there is almost always abuse with psychoactive substance use. Because as you start, you will eventually increase the amount you need. And as you increase it, you cause more damage to the brain. And that is why you begin to have behavioral problems and so many other physical health problems. Okay, with time, your behavior will begin to affect family, will begin to affect the community. Uh, you, you can take wrong decisions, you know, and all this can lead to problems with the law and with other aspects of your life. So, of course, taking weed is a bad thing, just like taking any other psychoactive substance. All right? We have psychoactive substances that, are, that, that, that have medical use, like uh, all these painkillers. Outside its medical use, it is absolutely wrong to use them because you are going to be causing more damage to yourself than good, and by extension, more damage to the society since you are not going to live in isolation your behavior the way you do things is going to affect the people around you and the society in general thank you 
All right, thank you very much, there, Doctor Abdullah. Um, okay, I, I, okay, I cited um, John Ogunjimi. I can't remember where last John Ogunjimi. I know he's always present, but it's quite a long time since he spoke on the platform, and I think um, I want to um, pass the mic to him today that he has um, stepped up to the speaker's corner. Let's um, hear what um, John has to say or if he has um, uh, a question. John, please go ahead and mute yourself and let's uh, hear from you today. Thank you so much, Mr. Baba Femi. I know it's been a while, um, but I, I've made it a part of my routine to always join, even when it's not convenient to speak, uh, especially maybe because my environment does not permit me to talk at the time. But um, always interesting conversations every time. Today, um, I think there's really nothing to add to what um, the speaker said, what she has said is true, especially as relating to family. For me, it has also been um, eye-opening regarding the dynamics of what abuse of drug does to individual family members, even those who may consider themselves not directly impacted by the effects of the drug use or abuse by the member of family. Um, another thing that I think she mentioned are those who are consciously or subconsciously enabling family members because of the, the or family members, yes, who are abusing drugs because of the pleasure or position that that person occupies in their life, uh, which is something to actually watch out for um, in in trying to assist or help them to get help. So um, once again, always interesting conversations. I just thought to come up on stage today to express gratitude to the agency for this good work that um, they've continued and to thank the presenter for the brilliant presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, on, um, John Ogunji. It's always um, a pleasure to have you and to listen to you. Thank you very much once again. Now, Dr. Abdullah, I will be taking some questions here that you would have to um treat um, um since we are very conversant with um dr hayatu din and her presentation so obviously uh it's also your area of specialization so please get set um, for these questions let me take the first one um these are questions from my dm um what do you consider is the right approach that parents should use to encourage prevent than the risk of treatment. Dr. Abdullah, did you get that? Okay, I guess uh, Dr. Nafisat is even back. Okay, Dr. Nafisat, you are back, right? Yes, I am, sir. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. May Almighty Allah accept our prayers. I I mean, I mean. The, net, the network helped you to step aside and take your <laughs> prayers. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank okay. you very much. So You're I was welcome. talking about the, the role of the family in the treatment stage and who to involve appropriately in the treatment or in the recovery, you know, for substance use. We acknowledge that the family is a major stakeholder for collaborative care for individuals with substance use disorders. However, some members of the family or individuals that play certain roles within the family might be, you know, um, hinder the progress or the recovery that an addict may want to go through. So, um, you know, individuals are actively using also active, those in active addiction, um, individuals that may be codependents, you know, um, of the addict may it may be counterproductive at least they should seek some help dealing with their own issues with their own attachment problems and then can be integrated into care other members of the family are those that are abusive or those that are averse to to the recovery process or that have a different um opinion or thinking regarding you know recovery for that individual such persons, it might be counterproductive involving them, you know, in integrating them in recovery from the get-go. They may hinder the progress. Then um, individuals that are not interested, family members are not interested or they cannot be bothered or they don't have the time or they are not available to actually support and play their own role, the role they need to play in order to help the individual recover. 
Now, after discussing all these things, we've been fo so focused on the, the person with the addiction and what to do to help that individual or protect them. Now, for family members, remember I talked about the various ways families can react to, to having, to discovering someone among them is using substance or, you know, there's, sometimes there's guilt, sometimes there's disappointment, sometimes there's um, shame. There's so many, you know, emotional reactions. Now, it, and it can also become very tiring, very exhausting, having to always be there, always be res carrying the responsibility of someone going through a substance use problem. So self-care is very important for families to cope, family members to be able to cope. This means that they are still able to prioritize their own physical and mental health while providing support, support and encouragement for the person going through the addiction. So they shouldn't, you know, over integrate themselves into the individual, take, assume too much responsibility. It should be understood that it is primarily the responsibility of the user. To, to decide when to stop. Or drawing, just setting up boundaries. You know, this and this and this is unacceptable. You can't do this in my house. If you do it, these are the consequences. Just sticking to such things, such rules, can go a long way in helping families to actually cope with what they are going through. And it can even be so, um, helpful for the user because if someone that is not used to being confined to rules or boundaries, you know, has been overstepping them, and then all of a sudden now, you know, there are rules and there are consequences. It is the responsibility now of the family members that have set those rules to ensure that they remain committed to those boundaries that they set. Not, you know, sometimes some people would say, I know, for if you ever do this again, I will never do this. But then the next time, the, maybe the first time they may try, the second time they will just give in and then still go back to the maybe unhealthy way that they were relating in the past. Now, other ways that family members can cope with um, with 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 substance use is um, they seek emotional support, seek informational support, ask you know, join programs like this where you can get information, ask questions, um, interact, see, explore various um, treatment options or treatment facilities available. See which one would be feasible, which one would be doable. What role you can play. Or how can you help this person or help um, the person using substance to actually recover and um, lead a, a, a more productive life? Now, we also rely heavily on the family to link up with possibly other support systems. You know, in clients where there, there's this, um, how do I say, it's a rich social support network. It's a lot easier where you find um, community support, community organizations like NGOs, you find peer support groups, Narcotics Anonymous, relatives of um, children of alcohol, you know, alcohol users. There are several, you know, groups where, you know, support groups where individuals or family members going through and um, having relatives with substance use problems can actually come together, support each other, you know, and um, encourage each other get resources, get help, you know, organize things. So such um, activities or facilities can be very helpful. And if they can even ease and um, establish them for relatives, for instance, someone that has gone through maybe rehabilitation needs to attend NA meetings, but is too far away. You know, he may need transport fare or at least some means of transportation to get to those meetings regularly. Sometimes we engage, we see patients, we want to engage them in occupational therapy, but because um, after, that's aftercare, you know, something for them to continue doing, to be productive and things like that. But because of the logistics of coming, you know, from a far location, it becomes problematic. Or if relatives are not ready to support in whatever way, they're not ready to, to give transport fare, they're not ready to escort the person to the hospital, they're not ready to... So it makes it problematic, you know, for even... The, the, the individual going through um, addiction. So in conclusion, I've come to the end. I, I would like um, us to really appreciate the role of the family in both protecting and you know, adversely worsening 
substance use disorders and other mental illnesses. Therefore, there's a need for us to have more open communications or more open dialogue regarding substance use, regarding problems we have in the in family dynamics, if there are issues, if there are discords, if there are any, let's say, um, misunderstandings. You know, try to nurture that open communication within the family sphere so that any problem, you know, can be, it can be made so much smaller simply by sharing it. Because you would get, one would likely get emotional support, would likely get informational support, would get advice, you know, would get encouragement if it's a nurturing environment. And also for everyone to understand that if you don't know what to do as a loved one of someone going through addiction, seek information. Information is now at our fingertips. Search online, seek, how can I help? What can I do? How do I talk to someone with substance use disorders? You would find it somewhere, you would find it online. So seek information, use it, have open dialogues, know that this is an illness and a person can actually recover from it the way we have recovered from malaria and typhoid and many other conditions in the past. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share the little knowledge I have, and then I hope this would be helpful to, to the audience. Thank you very Absol much. Absolutely, Dr. Nafisa, I'll tell you, that's not um, little knowledge, that's uh, deep, very deep, and um, you have been very appreciated. Uh, let me just um, read a couple of um, maybe some things to you in our DMs. Okay, let me skip. Um, there was one, uh, Joel Trade Hub, uh, was talking about um, cannabis. Um, while you were away, Dr. Abdullah stepped in to respond to that. Um, and I also have uh, Pwakana. Pwakana also raised some, um, had some points to um, the, the signs to watch out for in the family. And um, I think there is one here that I would like to reach to you. Excellent delivery. That is from Oluwole at Fola Oluwole. This um, says, excellent delivery, Dr. Nafisa, to you touched on very important points. The family is very important when it comes to prevention and also mitigating um, related issues. So, okay, now let's quickly get to, you see, have more work to do for another 30 minutes, Dr. I have to deal. Uh, you, uh, we have some questions um, already waiting for you here. Um, okay, this one is asking: What do you consider? Um, what do you consider is the right approach that parents should use to encourage prevention rather than the risk of treatment? Maybe we should be taking them one by one so that I don't um, bother you. Okay, so for prevention, you know the parenting. You know, I talked about it a lot because I believe it is one of the most crucial things for, you know, for the rearing of a child or, you know, who we are. So, and it usually starts from the choice of the parent, you know, the choice of the spouse or the choice of the partner. It usually starts from there because if the dynamics of that relationship, when the couple is just between them, is problematic, then... They, there are higher chances of not just substance use disorders, but many other behavioral problems can come up. Um, mental illnesses, other things, or they would, the ch children might, you know, turn out being very difficult people to live with, personality problems and things like that. So in prevention of substance use, if the parenting is gotten right, if one seeks to always improve, to nurture, to you know, be a parent, the responsibilities of parenting and parenthood are carried well. Authoritative parenting. We, we are aware that children that are raised with that style of parenting, they are less likely to use substances or have other mental health problems. Now, this style is something that's you know, it, it, it keeps evolving gradually, it's small, 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 but the basic principle is just that the, the bite and blow, you know, um, mechanism. Where there's a secure relationship, a secure attachment between the parents and the child, that means as the child was born, 
And as they were growing up, in those infants, those few months after birth, they had this dependent, you know, parent that was always there. They know that at any point in time, I can always come to this person. Now, as parents, as, you know, children grow up, sometimes they bring the wildest of things, you know, to us. They would, they would say something that you just be, ah, like you should knock their heads. As a parent, if you are deliberately being a parent, then that is the time for you to take a deep breath and calm down. Don't respond immediately because if you react, you lash out, you are quick to judge, you are quick to take action, you are likely going to make that person, that child close off and not tell you anything. So you will lose that open communication, you will lose that dialogue, and then the bond becomes shaky. It becomes shaky. So, and that can breach trust and not allow that child to have that secure relationship with the parent. Now, other things are um, a large chunk of the times we hear, especially in our society where couples have problems, the, everybody will say, no, you stay for your children, stay for your children, and things like that. Sometimes relationship, these kinds of relationships are very abusive. This, the, the, uh, the victim becomes so preoccupied with you know, the problems they have that they don't, pay, they don't actually pay attention to parenting the children. So they may end up going out to be the lost child. And this can even lead to substance use, neglected. So for me, for me, I still feel it is the parenting, the style of the parenting that is the most important in preventing substance use. The way the individual was nurtured, the way the individual was monitored, was coached, was guided, was mentored through life, you know, getting to adolescence before they probably start experimenting. If a child is encouraged to give your opinion, Give, you know, give your objections. And if you had a conversation with the child, okay, you know, friends can bring cigarette for you to try. So let's practice how you would say no to them. Would you want to try substance? It can lead to this, it can lead to that. You practice and allow the child, you know, so that they are prepared. Whenever that kind of scenario is brought to them, they have been coached and mentored at home. How to now handle this? So for me, in my own opinion, this is what I think. All right, thank you very much there, um, Dr. Hayatu Dean. Okay, let me read this one also to, this person is asking you, from your practice, what are some of the barriers that families have highlighted in speaking to their children about um, the use of substance use or even experimentation? Okay, thank you. Um, I think I've heard of um, fear a lot. You know, they, they, some think that if they talk to the children, maybe they are too young. We know the average age for, exper for beginning to use substance in Nigeria is around 11 years. So sitting down with a nine-year-old and telling them, you know, talking to them of a substance use, you think that maybe you will now be putting the idea in their head. Please, that is not it. it by then, they, they know. They know if you if you engage them enough, find out you would you would be shocked what they actually know about substance use. So we have that as one reason. I also see um, parents being, you know, using avoidance. You know, they kind of wishfully think that if I don't if I don't talk about this or if I pretend it doesn't exist, I can wish it away, and it doesn't it doesn't help. It doesn't. And being permissive, you know, just allowing the world to teach the children or the persons can lead to them being misguided and misinformed. So I think, um, if I understand the question well, I think these are some of the reasons I have observed in my practice. All right. Thank you. I have um, this one again from the same person. When we speak about families and substance use we often assume the child is the target person but what systems are available to support children as a vulnerable group in coping with parents who use substances or have mental health issues um, have mental health disorders should i come again or you got the question Dr. i think i think i got the question i think i got okay. the question yes yes 
Okay, so he's talk, um, it's talking about where the children are the relatives, are, being, are the family, and then the parent is the one with the mental illness or the substance use disorder. So what do we have in place? Um, I think our social services are largely, how do I say, inadequate or not, you know, really prioritized. Now, what we have, you see, is some level of, how do I say, a rich multi-generational family network. At least in some rural areas or some communities, you would find that, um, you know, you won't find just the father, mother, and children living together. You would have the grandmother, the uncles, aunties, and things like that. Now, ideally, ideally, there should be a clear-cut way. You know, we're aware of the Child Rights Act that tries to protect the rights of children, you know, and things like that. But the implementation is largely the problem. Now, in situations where such rich family networks exist or extended family networks exist, sometimes they would have to come in. We have seen cases where family members have come in to basically take over, you know, the children of the person with the mental illness or the person with the substance use disorder so that the children don't go through, um, you know, this epileptic, you know, um, parenting or epileptic, you know, background within the family setting. So for me, I know the instruments that are supposed to be provided by government aren't fully effective, but we can have our own, how does it, we can nurture and support what we already have in our culture, which is that multi-generational, large, you know, extended family network. If that can be supported, as some social mechanism by which if children are taken, for instance, from um, someone, let's say his children are being taken over by his brother, if some support can be rendered to the brother, not necessarily from him, from the person that lost the children, but from government or some other scheme that can support that individual, then that can help in, in ameliorating this. For those that eventually, you know, would have, for us, in, you know, in a hospital where we work, when we have families like that, we try to engage, we engage not just the ones we see, but even the other family members that don't usually come with the, with the person to the hospital. We try to engage them, extend help to them so that they know that if they need anything, they can always reach out. We are there, we would educate, we would support and then provide as much support as we can. I, I I hope. Okay. I hope I, 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 I absolutely. You 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 answered. You answered. Um, okay. Um, okay. I, I I see you, Nelly. I see you are raising your hand. But let me. I saw um, some of um, uh, Doctor Nafisa. Quest, I mean, colleagues um, asking some. Okay. Or maybe they are. Okay. Let me read this one from uh, mental health, Excel mental health foundation. That's actually the handle Dr. Abdullah uses. Thank you very much, Dr. Nafisa Adhaya today for that excellent delivery. Dr. Nafisa Adhaya today is, as, is an excellent uh, psychiatrist and a proud fellow of the Mandela Washington fellowship. That um, much we know because we read that in her profile. Okay, um, I'll come to you. Um, Nelly, I've seen your question in a DM. I won't read since you're already on the speaker's corner. The next, I'll pass the mic to you. But okay, I see Dr. Dokita Ladega. Um, Dr. Ladega is also a medical doctor, so I think he's asking a question. I'm asking you a question here, Dr. Nafisa. Thank you for that well articulated presentation, Dr. Nafisa. One, I want to ask about hotlines in Nigeria for suicide emergencies. Working around that space right now, but we don't have much governmental support to reach out to during um, having such uh, cases around. I I I think um, the state got the. I mean the state government. Okay, let me let me listen to you first. Let's listen to you first, Doctor mm -hmm. Navisa, before I make some okay. contributions to that. Okay, thank you very much. So regarding suicide prevention, um, there are a few, there are some hotlines, and I think the main there's um, this week, the Honorable Minister of Health and Social Welfare, 
um, you know, um, launched a program for the a national strategy, I think, for substance pre uh, suicide prevention, sorry, in Nigeria. You know, there was a, a how do I say, a program was, a start, you know, to, to actually take off on how to, you know, develop, you know, um, promote mental health care in Nigeria. So the current government is really interested in that. Prior to that, there's um, this group, um, SERPI, you know, Suicide Risk Prevention Intervention. It's a group of professionals, mental health professionals that came together, started with like a volunteer service, but it has scaled up to a national kind of service where we have volunteers all over the country with hotlines being available um, that people can call in and some level of telepsychiatric services can be offered, you know, um, online. Um, however, the integration, isn't it, from, you know, um, electronic consultations or reviews to physical care within facilities. Now, this is a problem that is not only for suicide, but nearly every form of mental illness. The Mental Health Act was, you know, signed into law early this year, but the implementation was still yet to catch up with that. So I agree with you that the government's support is still... It's, um, it's not yet there, but I believe they are working toward it with the recently, you know, inaugurated um, program on scaling up of mental health in the, in the entire, developing a national strategy for how to implement and scale up mental health services in the country. Now, that, that is a plus. Um, regarding, you know, um, helplines for suicide, I'm, I'm aware that it's not only the serpent. Um, like Acido Foundation does that, Excel Mental Health Foundation. So many, you know, NGOs actually have hotlines where individuals can call in for suicide prevention, you know, have some counseling sessions over the phone and things like that. And then, however, I agree with you that transiting into structured care can be problematic, honestly. So, but I don't know. Um, sir, your further comments? Yeah, thank you that you almost said it all. I, that I was trying to say that apart from the um, um, national system platform that um, maybe uh, the Federal Ministry of Health um, is providing or might have provided, I also know that some state governments also have um, some systems in place that work within um, their their own uh, areas of responsibility in addition to quite a number of uh, non-governmental organizations that also have been just about um, searching for this information online definitely we, we would um, get um, get uh, some um, active and efficient um, um, systems in place apart from what obtains at the national level I'm also aware that a state like Lagos has um, a number of sources in place, even with um, ready ambulances and um, some uh, paramedics um, that can always respond quickly at some uh, at some stations around the metropolis and even beyond the metropolis. I think I have seen that, uh, and that's why you would have seen a number of times um, when there are issues of people trying to uh, jump into the lagoon on third Milan bridge or some other places you have um, um, the emergency people coming in to rescue them or even to attend to them all of those things i, I believe um, that they may not be um, they may not have that uh, wide coverage as we expect but i i, I definitely know that i have seen uh, some of those things then, okay, Nelly, um, I was about passing the mic to Nelly. Okay, let me see. But Nelly is off um, the table where we offered her. But let me, I think I've also seen, I suspect maybe uh, this person, Abdul Samad Hamisu Ahmad. Would you, do you have something to say, a question or a contribution? I've seen you smiling uh, to us since, and I believe you are a medical person. If you can hear me, Abdul Samad, Hamisu, Ahmad, because we have um, less than 20 minutes. Yes, yes. thank you. So, uh, 
can hear you and then I'm very privileged and humbled to be here. I am a nurse and a researcher in the field of uh, substance abuse uh, under the mentorship of the Psychiatric Hospital, Aro Abekuta. I've been working as a private entity in collaboration with that unit, the Drug Abuse Rehabilitation and Treatment of that hospital for seven years now and it's still ongoing. And then over the years I've cut off with uh, so many fascinating realities of substance abuse. Uh, not basically focusing on hard drugs, but along so many other substances that we abuse. And I appreciate the discussion and so many points that were critically addressed by the facilitator, Dr. Hayat Udin, is very appreciative. And then I have, uh, with the years of my research, I have, uh, I would just li like to highlight two areas that I have major concern with. I would like her to drill more on that. Number one is the approach, the community, parents, and uh, guidance usually take when it comes to first initiation of uh, intervention in cases of substance abuse. We know that uh, there are some abusers that are just uh, experimentalists, some are just social users, and then some are regular users, and we have the addict. There are a lot of cases that we used to misplace this priority on who is this and how can we help me. When we take approach to help a starter that's an experimentalist and we are treating him like an addict or a regular user, it sounds a more of promoting his status in that field. And then mostly you find out that individual, we might not end up helping him. Instead, we promote him from his initial ground and then we are lifting him up to a level that he was not. And then him facing that challenge from the community or from the guidance that were trying to make effort to rescue him, by doing so in the wrong way, it might end up now giving me another stamina to be more than what he was according to how they were thinking he was. And that's a major uh, problem that I have. And uh, we've been, we are still working on that. And then we are doing much of community work to create awareness regarding that. And then the major, another concern that I have is that uh, there is a very massive link between any substance abuse to other ones. For example, uh, we have children that abuse or teenagers that abuse chocolate. There is a very high link between abuse of chocolate and tendencies of those same individuals to abuse other substances like uh, hard drugs, cosmetic products, uh, and the likes. And then you have young children that usually abuse games, this uh, uh, sport games, uh, uh, Android application games and stuff like that. They abuse all of that. And then before you know it, there will now be a, some kind of a trans, transmission from that level of uh, that Android abuse or whatever they're abusing. And then they can now have that same exposure to abuse something which is now will be more harmful than that game, for example, in the cases of cigarettes. So these are major things that I've just, uh, I have among the many things I have, but I think I would like a doctor to, to drill more on that. One is that aspect of approach when it comes to who are we trying to help. And then this second one is abusing of whatever type of simple substance that we see in home, allowing those children to continue to abuse it. For example, there are children that we know that in the, in the house, they abuse Pepe, Yaji. And then allowing them to continue doing, maintaining that habit is giving them another stamina that they can easily switch to whatever type of abuse. There are those that we know that they abuse cosmetic products, like mostly in the cases of female. Before you know it, they can just easily switch into abuse of other narcotics or uh, hypnotics very easily because they, they have that already built up a mindset on abuse. So that's just the two areas uh, I would like uh, doctor to highlight more and then I appreciate and I'm humbled to be here. Thank you for the for the chance to, to, to air out. Thank you very much there, Abdul Saman Hamisu Ahmad. I think Dr. Nafisa, I think that um, that sounds so interesting there, <laughs> uh, especially the link between 
um, abuse of chocolate, games, mm. social media, I mean, all these yeah. um, gadgets and drugs. Yeah. Let's listen to you. Okay, thank you very much for the for the questions. I'm bringing this to the to you know to to bear. Now, um, for this, the first you know question was about um the the type of the substance use disorder, like um people being overly labeled or overdiagnosed or something like that. For me, I I have a slightly different view. I feel that any use of any psychoactive substance before it is even called a psychoactive substance, is already a problem. So any use is a problem. Whether it is social use, whether it is ex, you know, just experimental use, whether it is this, the reason is because we cannot predict who will become dependent. I've heard of families where the father would be the one to take the, let's say, 10-year-old you know, son to the bar and introduce him to alcohol. The prince, or should I say, the thinking behind that is that if I make it acceptable in the family front, you won't go and do it behind my back. Yes, I get it. I get the whole thing. However, you don't know the one that would have the enzymes or the hormones in the body and the chemical changes in the brain that would kickstart that process of addiction. So he may do it and enjoy it and never tell the father and be, continue to do it behind the father's back. That means the father introduced him to it. The same thing with some drugs that we use, like tramadol was initially a prescription medication. Pentazosin now is also a problem publicly. It's prescribed in a hospital by a healthcare personnel given to individuals, but people now use it beyond the measure. Why? Because it's not everybody that uses it for medic medical purposes that would become dependent. So because the risk is there, it can lead to anything. So, however, for me, in my understanding of substance use, remember what I was talking about, the causality, biological, psychological, and social factors. Now, whether the, if there's a problem, let's say, psychologically, with the way the person copes, uses defense mechanisms, the way the person copes with difficulty, copes with disappointment, you understand? Now, that means that person might use the substance just to cope with stresses of life, even if the person is just using it socially. If it's a young person, remember the brain is still growing at that stage. So it will just teach the brain that once you feel this way, use this substance. Once you use it, that's all. Me and you that are probably not using substances would, not, would get relief from that stress without having to use substance. So whether the person is using it socially, whether the person is using it experimentally, whether the person is using it depend, you know, as a dependent user, that person would need to learn coping skills. And that is why most rehabilitation programs, orthodox rehabilitation programs, there's always something on coping skills. I ju I'm just using this as an example. The, the point is that if a person is using it, let's say socially, then you need to ask, Okay, he's using it because of peer pressure. Does it mean that he can't stay or he can't survive or live a productive and healthy life without having friends or without doing whatever his friends want him to do? You want, to, you want a person to be independent, to be able to stand his own feet, isn't it? On his own two feet, to live a productive and fruitful life. So if that person is using socially, for instance, that person may need social skills training. That person may need coping skills training. So it's, that is why for anyone with a substance use problem and going for treatment, that person needs to be assessed so that specific goals can be drawn up for how, you know, for, for each individual. Every rehab, proper rehabilitation program I know has a, a pre-assessment you know, assessment where the areas that need work on for that particular individual are identified so that targeted treatment targeted rehabilitation can be done for that person to recover from it. So if the person, for instance, is using socially and now ends up in a rehabilitation program where there are people that are dependent on 10 substances, if that person will still get to learn coping skills that he needs, will still get to learn social skills that he needs, for me, it's a success either way. That is presuming your question was about the, the how do I say, orthodox care. If it's in the community, yes, for most people that are social users, it may not get to the extent or occasional users. 
So long as if the person usually is productive, is not causing any problem for anybody, is not losing money, is not wasting things or becoming, you know, stealing, rarely would anyone ever raise an eyebrow or seek help for that individual. Regarding cross-dependence, because I think that was what you were talking about. The person, you know, in two, young people using chocolates and then now crossing to using substances or whatever, whatever. It's still the same response. The, whatever the chocolate was doing for them in the brain, let's say it was giving, you know, firing off in the, in the brain, dopamine, you know, get feeling happy, feeling motivated, you know, and then wanting to use it more and more and more and more. So it's not surprising that they would replace whatever that um, chocolate is doing for them with another substance. But it is if there is a deficiency in the, either in the way they cope, either in the way they function, the way they behave, the way they deal with stress, the way they deal with disappointment. So I would say the, my answer is still the same. Whether it is game addiction, whether it is gambling addiction, whether it is you know it crossing from one to the other, for all of them, there's a common ground. There is some deficiency, some issue, some inadequacy to some extent with how to cope, how to deal with life. And so such individuals can benefit from whatever form of way they can learn healthier coping skills, learn, um, you know, um, practice better defense mechanisms and things like that so that they live a more productive life without having to use any substance. I, I don't know if I, I, the, the, the answer, I, I've answered or attempted your questions adequately. I, I, believe, I believe you, you already uh, took care of um, all of them. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Mathisal um, Hayatuddin. Um, while you prepare your thoughts for your final uh, closing remarks, let me bring um, like uh, the people in our DM are trying to dominate the conversation here today. Well, well appreciated. Um, okay, let me, okay, there is somebody, that's Nelly, she actually, I believe she's um, a woman, Nelly Agu, she actually came on the speaker's table and I think um, uh, she dropped to the listener's corner again, but she dropped the message in our DM already. Do we please have a support group in Ikeja? I think Ikeja is in Lagos. That question, I don't know which support group she's talking about now, but then if you understand what she's saying, doctor, but then that's just one, hold that one. Um, let me scroll to another one. I just saw, okay, I think earlier, um, this, um, this handle, Joel Trade Hub, once I mean, asked the question which Dr. Abdullah attended to, I'll read that, then I'll read again his latest um, drop. He was asking them, please, I want to ask, is smoking weed a bad thing? I understand weed is illegal in Nigeria. However, misusing it should be what we should um, mostly talk about. And secondly, does smoking weed make one make wrong decisions in life? Just hold that. Those are the things Dr. Abdullah addressed earlier. Now, I've just seen he dropped another message two minutes ago. Can't we, can't the use of smoking weed be managed? Okay, I think uh, you may have to speak to all of this now, Dr. Uh, I have to dinner, then you wrap it up with your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So regarding the use of weed, now what we know is that um, it's a psychoactive substance, which means it primarily works in the brain. Now what it does is that it changes how the normal, let's say the brain is the engine of a car, you know, it, it changes how the wiring goes. That is what use of any psychoactive substance does, including weed. Now, weed, many people see it as, and you know, it's what's there. You know, what's the big deal? It's just smoking weed. However, I think it is one of the most dangerous of psychoactive substances. I consider it more dangerous than cocaine in our society. Why? The reason is because weed is far more affordable, so more people tend to use it. Now, the risks of having a frank psychotic mental illness, really running, you know, um, cuckoo, is up to six times higher for people that use weed than other people that don't use. Now, 
we know we're aware that many countries, you know, in the world, in Europe, in America, some states have legalized cannabis. What the expectation was that, you know, when it's legalized, it's no longer illegal. So there's no restriction to it. People can use it, you know, and then there will be regulation in use. What the recent, you know, evidences are pointing to is that there's actually an upsurge in the use of cannabis. And more potent forms are being processed every single day. Just like we have here in Nigeria. Before it used to be just grass, then once in a while you find skunk for those that can afford it. But now, every day there's a new one. Loud, Arizona, whatever. Different ones keep coming up every day. All in a bit to get a more potent, you know... Um, the, 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 the most dangerous one, the moment is the colos. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> so, thank you very much, sir. So, the, the issue is that we know that it's not easy to stop. However, the damage it causes to the brain is unimaginable. Those of us that see, you know, um, what the science shows about, you know, how the brain looks for those that use weed and those that don't use weed. It's just very similar to, you know, those images we see for lungs, um, of lungs, users, uh, smokers and non-smokers. It's almost that bad. You understand? Very, very damaging. And cannabis can not just only cause the colo per se, you know, psychosis, but it can lead to so many, many problems. You know, reduced productivity. Some use it for inspiration, in quote. For most artists, that's what they say. They claim to use it for inspiration. Yes, what cannabis does is that it slows time. You know, it slows your perception of time. So it will feel as if everything is going slower. So you're thinking, you're able to pay attention to the smallest of details. Now, in the process, someone described it a while back to me that when, when you smoke weed and you see a dog passing, you start thinking, Who, where is the father of this dog? Where is the mother of the dog? Where did they come from? Are they also the same color? Are they not the same color? So imagine wasting 30 minutes of your time just doing that, trying to recover from the, you know, trying to experience and recover from the effect of weed. 30 minutes that you could use to be productive, do something else with that time. And before one fully recovers from the effect, so much would have passed. Imagine if it was by the roadside where someone could come and knock them off or a car, you know, rams through them. So the risks are so many of weed, of using cannabis. For people that are already using, trying to stop. It can also be done for anyone. One could start with tailing off. You know, you try to cut down, you know, trying, um, how would I say, lesser concentrations, things like that to give the brain some time. If you need, this is trying on your own. You need professional help, seek professional help. There are services available all over the country which you can access, which one can access to actually, um, you know, be able to stop cannabis use. That is what, for me personally, I don't advocate on the harm reduction thing for cannabis or any other psychoactive substances. I believe in abstinence. That is what I, I, I personally promote. I believe in abstinence because whatever amount of substance, no matter how small, no matter how diluted, it is still a toxin to the brain and a toxin to the human body. Um, the other questions, I hope I've responded to this adequately. Um, the, the other question, if I can remember, I think the, main, the questions were all on the weed, the use of the weed. Then regarding support group in Ikeja, personally, I'm not aware, but I am sure you can get more information you know, to reach out in Lagos, there's a psychiatric hospital which has a rehab facility. It's been there for a very long time. It's it's been there for a very long time. I'm I'm sure there would be something. There would be something provided. You know, once you can, if you can make an inquiry, you might be able to find um other facilities, other how would I say centers that have you know these peer support groups available. Um well. I think I think those were the questions I had. Um, I want to especially appreciate the NDLEA for organizing such a program. We don't get to have 
open many open conversations regarding substance use, what to do, how to go about it, you know, and things like that. As a family member of a loved one, dealing with substance, you know, substance use in the family, we know can be extremely stressful and difficult and challenging to navigate. However, ha having open, honest, honest conversations regarding it is the way to go. Some of us avoid, try to avoid having to discuss the issue or we blame others, blame witchcraft, blame evil spirits or whatever it is. All these are counterproductive and unhelpful ways. They don't allow us addressing the main issue at hand. So I would encourage all of us to, to have more open conversations with our loved ones, with others, with anyone we can regarding substance use disorders and how we can prevent them in the family sphere and in the larger community. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to talk and I hope this is helpful. Thank you very much there, Dr. Nafisa Hayatu Din, a consultant neuropsychiatrist at the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, um, Kaduna. Thank you, we're indeed grateful. Before um, we draw the curtain, I would like to um, encourage um, Nelly Agu. Nelly Agu, please, if you still have, um, if uh, you still have um, um, some need, I mean, for support or assistance, please, you are free to call uh, helpline. That's the NDLA's helpline, 0800-1020-3040. They will be very glad to help you, to assist you. Um, in uh, giving you the direction or guide to whatever support you need any part, in any part of the country. Thank you very much there. Once again, we'd like to appreciate um, our guest speaker today, Dr. Nafisa Hayatu. I believe um, she's um, giving a very awesome and wonderful account of herself. Indeed, her colleagues have said so much about her that um, all that her colleagues had said um, uh, probably enough testimonial or profile for her um, without um, even us going through her profile, I believe, um, uh, from the testimonies of her colleagues in the medical profession, we already know how brilliant, how excellent, and how deep uh, the depth of her knowledge in this is. I want to appreciate you, Dr. Nafisa Hayatu. Thank you very much for being part of our conversation today and for really sharing from your depth of knowledge with us. We pray that Almighty God will continue to keep you and your entire family to support what you do for humanity. Thank you very much. We're glad to have you. On that thank note, I also, yes, on that note, I would also like to thank um, some of those that have been part of the conversation today. We cannot recognize everybody, but then just bear with us. we we'll just uh, pick some few people once in a while. I'd like to once again appreciate the International Society of Substance Use Professionals, ISOP Nigeria. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, um, our own Dr. Abdullah of um, SM Mental Health and um, Amadou Bello University Teaching Hospital, Zaria. Thank you, uh, Patriotic and Patriot. Um, also, okay, we we'll appreciate you also, Dr. Gidado Mohammed, Dr. Gidado Mohammed, Dr. Abdullah had already given you out, so um, some of my colleagues will be reaching out to you uh, to engage with you so that you can also be part of the conversation on this space. Thank you, Ikeshuku, Funsho Jimo, Blank Mind, Dr. Keita, Farida Hazan, uh, Prince Jacobs. Abdul Samad Hamisu Ahmad, thank you. Our own John Ogunjimi, thank you. Peaceful Peace. Hamza Abdullah, Dr. Fatima Abu Ali, thank you. Uh, my own uh, Tinui Dowu, Tinui Dowu joins us from Maryland, US. Thank you very much for making it, um, for finding the time. I know you'll be at work, uh, even though it was Thanksgiving yesterday in the US, but I think. Um, your holiday has been called short today. Thank you for finding time to be with us on this space today. Thank you, Gambo Abuba. Thank you, Mohammed Bafo Bashir, our own commander in Kwara Bashir Bahim. Sunday, John Parabawa, Salman Alicia, and quite um, a number of people. Okay, Nelly Agu, um, our own Kanu Shuku. Thank you everyone for taking um, time to be part of this conversation today. I bet um, it's been an interesting and um, 
encouraging, informative, and educative one. Thank you once again. Our guest today, Dr. Nafisat Hayatuddin, for giving a good account of yourself. Before I go, let me acknowledge some of my colleagues that have been supportive behind the scenes. She did Musa Francis, Dele Mahmoud Blessing, Kumbi Vina, Charity, Phil, Val, John, Ima Ali, and the rest of you. I appreciate all of you for standing by to support um, um, at the process all through today without issues. That's the way I want it to be every week. God bless you guys. And on that note, I would like to encourage each and every one of us to please note that this conversation is recorded and is ready on our handles. Please feel free to share with um, your friends, your colleagues, and family members, especially those you know uh, may be having issues with this problem of substance abuse or mental health so that they can benefit them. Um, from some of the deep um, knowledge that have been shared um, in our conversation today. I remain yours sincerely, Femi Baba Femi. I'll be right back next week by the guests of God, same time. Before then, keep it safe. i hand you over to Mahmoud to shut down properly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, sir, the host, and of course, the NDLU's Director of Media and Advocacy for guiding us throughout today's program. Before we go, our listeners who are enthusiastic about the agency can visit our social media handles at NDLU on this corner here on Instagram, YouTube, and X. On Facebook, it is at NDLU one Do join us same time next week for another edition of this wonderful program. I remain Mahmoud Issa. Over to you, Bamidele. Nai go, nai make a key, go gaga. Sinifu, onya. David Jones, David. Nai go, and go de, na ti bo bo. Sinifu, onya. In my mind, I'm on. She don't wanna me say you go beat us and I the only thing